Well, uh, thank you all for being here and uh, I also would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give these lectures. Um, so the presentation will be slightly multimedia. Uh, mostly will be blackboard and chalk. Uh, sometimes just speaking. Uh, and there'll be minor, minor interludes with uh, computer slides. Uh, one thing I'd like to say is that uh, some of you may know I gave a 14-hour course on the same subject, uh, which started in May with the floods. Maybe that's what brought the floods. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, the notes for these lectures are uh, online at the IHES website. Okay, so you will be able to read more if you want to in there. So uh, the, the talk is, uh, the series of talks is about uh, solid turn resolution for the energy critical wave equation. So let me start out by saying a few words about uh, solid turn resolution. Um, for for uh, quite a long time, the there's been a belief in the community in mathematical physics that uh, one can understand the long time asymptotics or general solutions to dispersive equations uh, in the following way that the long term asymptotics, thank you Fabrice, <laughs> uh, that the long term asymptotics is given as a superposition of uh, modulated solitons, traveling wave solutions, radiation, which are linear solutions, and uh, small errors. And uh, it's this, this is not a theorem or a conjecture, it's more a belief. And uh, this belief ha has been uh, named the soliton resolution conjecture but it's not a conjecture, it's more of a collection of uh, conjectures. In each particular instance, the, there's a different uh, version of the, of the conjecture. So uh, this, I think, was first uh, uh, postulated in work of Kruskal and Sabuski in the, in the mid-60s, who did some uh, numerical experiments which led them to this uh, realization uh, in connection with the correct Debris equation. And uh, these numerical experiments were really motivated by the pioneering ones of Fermi, Pasta, Ulam um, at Los Alamos during the, the Second World War, which was uh, at the beginning of when you could start doing uh, meaningful numerical simulations. Okay. Uh, now this uh, <coughs> conjecture it seems to me to be a very remarkable assertion because you, you start with a nonlinear dispersive equation and a priori there's no reason to believe that the, there's any way to tell what the long time behavior will be. It could be completely chaotic. But uh, this uh, conjecture uh, says that, in fact, there is a simplification. If you wait long enough, things sort of resolve. And uh, then the, the long term asymptotics looks like a superposition of these uh, basic nonlinear objects, which are solitons, traveling waves, and a linear object, which is the radiation term, and something that goes to zero. Uh, until not so long ago, the only cases in uh, which this conjecture had been established uh, rigorously for Hamiltonian systems uh, was in integrable situations. <coughs> so integrable nonlinear equations are uh, nonlinear equations which somehow can be reduced to a collection of linear problems. And in those cases, uh, there was a mathematical proof of this uh, soliton resolution 
conjecture in some examples like the correct the risk equation, the modified correct the risk equation, and the cubic uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation on the line. Um, so uh, in the mid 2000s, uh, Frank Merle and I developed uh, an approach to study uh, the long time behavior of solutions to dispersive equations in critical problems, mainly uh, below the ground state level. And uh, it was uh, when studying uh, one example in this direction, namely the nonlinear wave equation, that uh, we became uh, uh, persuaded that this was a, a good example in which to test soliton resolution. And uh, so then we started a, a long time uh, project with uh, Thomas Dulcaire, and uh, this led to uh, a number of papers and uh, eventually to, to a very uh, substantial result in this direction, which I, I'm going to talk about in these lectures. Okay. So let me start by describing what uh, the energy critical wave equation is. So I will work. in R3 cross R. <coughs> Recently I was giving another mini course and there was a moat under and I kept losing the erasers until in the end I could no longer erase. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's hope it doesn't happen here. Uh, So this is the energy critical nonlinear wave equation. Um, in the three dimensional case, uh, the, the results that I will be discussing in these lectures are mostly uh, also true in dimensions three, four, and uh, in dimensions four, five, and six. I will not discuss that here. Um, when there's something that's truly specific to R3, I will mention it. Okay. Now there's an associated uh, linear equation, which is the linear wave equation, which is a classical equation. So uh, we have a right-hand side H and initial data V0 and V1. Oh, I should say what H1 dot is. H1 dot is the space of functions which have a gradient in L2. So it's a very simple space of functions. And L2 is L2. I <coughs> don't think I want to define L2. OK. And V1 is in L2. So this uh, linear wave equation of course, can be solved explicitly by the Fourier method. Maybe I put the cosine first.
And I'm using functional notation here. The sine of the square root of the Laplacian in Fourier variables is si uh, the multiplier sine of absolute value of xi. Okay, and so on. So, uh, of course, given this formula to solve u solves nlw by take uh, h equal to u to the fifth and so if that integral equation holds where we have a solution okay and I will sometimes abbreviate things by calling this linear operator s of t of v0 v1 and uh, the other thing that I will be doing many times is I will write let's say u arrow of t to be the vector the t u of t. Now one thing that is extremely useful in everything we will be doing is the finite speed of propagation for the linear wave equation. Okay? So I'll draw a picture. Uh, so finite speed. So suppose that support of V0, V1 and suppose that H is 0 in, in there in the tent, then uh, <coughs> V is zero inside the tent. Okay? This is a standard finite speed of propagation. And uh, this is true for any dimension. In three dimensions, there's the strong Huygens principle. So let me take, so this is uh, d equals to 3. So this will be x0, this will be r, and uh, <coughs> so in this case we take that the support of v0, v1 is contained in Vx0R and uh, then <laughs> we take this cone and uh, the usual finite speed of propagation gives us that V is zero out there uh, but the strong Huygens principle and I'm going to run out Okay, let's pretend that this has slope one. This is where the support is. That's what the strong Huygens principle tells me. Okay? So there's nothing here and there's nothing here. And that's only true in 3D. And the difference between 3D and 2D, you can imagine the following. When you throw a pebble in a pond, you see all the little ripples, and they continue to <coughs> see little, little ripples forever. But when you're in 3D and you see a supersonic plane go by, you hear the sonic boom for one instant, and then that's gone completely. So that's what's happening there. 
Okay? All right. So the last thing, can people see at the bottom here? Yeah? Okay. So the last tool that we need in order to give a meaning to these equations are the so-called Strickert estimates. And it says the following. So, uh, plus okay. So you have a control of the energy norm as time goes on in terms of the energy of the initial data and the L0 and the H1 cross L2 norm, uh, I'm sorry, and the L1 L2 norm of H. So this, this notation means I first take the norm in X and I take the L1 norm in T of that norm. And uh, here I take the L10 norm in X and here and then the L5 norm in T. Okay? So this term plays the role of a Sobolev estimate in the theory. So you can think of it as some extra norm that you control that has the same homogeneity and it's just like a Sobolev type embedding. Okay, so now I'm going to just say a few words about the well-posedness uh, theory for NLW. Suppose I take as an interval i, there exists some delta positive such that if i is contained in r is an interval of time and when I look at the linear norm but I restrict the time to i <coughs> is less than delta, then there exists a unique u-solving NLW and the mapping from data to solution is continuous in the appropriate norms and uh, is it, there's uniqueness among those things for which the L5, L10 norm is finite. Okay. Moreover, the linear equation and the, non, uh, the linear solution and the nonlinear solution are very close. maybe soup in T, well, for any T. <coughs> and this is for T in I. Okay? So you have a unique solution, depends continuously and remains close to the uh, linear solution just by keeping this norm small. And this is, we refer to this norm as the dispersive norm. Okay? Space-time norm, scattering norm, dispersive no norm, Strickert's norm. We will call it the S of I norm.
Okay. Now, how do you prove this? You just do a, a standard fixed point argument. There's nothing more to do. Okay. So an immediate consequence of this are the following things. Um, small data yield global in time solutions. If you can't read my handwriting, please let me know. Okay, and I'll try to do better. And this global in time solutions scatter. And that means that there is uh, u0 plus minus u1 plus minus such that This is H1 cross L2. Okay? So what this what scattering means is that eventually the behavior becomes the behavior of a linear solution. That's what the dynamics is. Okay? And why is this true? Well, because of the Strickard's Inequality, if this, uh, if this is small, then this is small. And therefore, we can apply that there. OK? Now, next, uh, the other thing you can say is that for general data, which need not be small, there exists a u which is continuous which is with values in H1 cross L2, solving and <coughs> which is in L5 of I prime L10 of X for all i prime compactly contained in i, such that u solves the equation, and i is maximal. So many times I will refer to the maximal interval of existence. Okay. Okay. Now a very important tool in what follows will be played by something <coughs> that we call the perturbation theorem, long time perturbation theorem. Suppose zero is in the interval i and we have a u bar which is continuous from I with values in H1 cross L2. It has bounded the Strickert's norm. It solves
some kind of inhomogeneous wave equation, possibly inhomogeneous, then there exists an epsilon star the, which depends only on m with the property that f is small and I take u0, u1 close to u of 0 in h1 cross l2 then there exists a unique solution u little u of nlw in I such that um, it's close to you in H1 cross L2 and in L5 L10 and at time 0 it equals u0 e1. So this is a called a, a long time perturbation theorem because this epsilon star does not depend on the length of the interval. So the interval could be as large as we want. Okay? And this is a, a key technical tool. There is, is there some mistake here? U and capital U. What does capital U solve exactly? <laughs> and so U solves the same equation? No, U solves the NLW with no F. Okay? Yeah, that, that was a typo there. Okay, so it's a way to do small perturbations, but for a very long time. Okay. So the next thing I want to explain very briefly is why we call this the energy critical equation. And that's because it's critical with respect to the scaling. If U solves NLW, <coughs> U lambda of xt, which is lambda to the minus a half, U of x over lambda, t over lambda, also solves NLW and the norm of U lambda at 0 of H1 cross L2 is exactly the same as the norm of U at 0 in H1 cross L2. So this scaling doesn't affect the H1 cross L2 norm. Okay? And that's why we call this equation <coughs> energy critical. This is the energy space, and the scaling doesn't affect the norm of the initial data in the energy space. Okay? So in particular, we cannot make ourselves have small data by scaling, because we can't change anything. Okay? 
All right. Yeah. Now I'm going to do slides for just a few minutes because there's some other object that I need to introduce. <coughs> And that's what we call the profile decomposition, which is a, a, a sort of another tool for the nonlinear wave equation. So, are we ready? Yeah, yeah no, no, I need to do more than that. Okay, so this uh, is a, a tool that we use in connection with concentration compactness in the study of uh, nonlinear <laughs> wave equations. Uh, this nonlinear, uh, this profile decomposition for the nonlinear wave equation was introduced by Bahuri and Girard in the late 90s and uh, in connection of the with the wave equation and by Merrill and Vega in connection with the Schrodinger equation. This was more or less sim simultaneous. But we'll be concentrating on the wave equation here. And so this, you can think of, can think of this embedding here as some kind of Sobolev embedding. And there's some lack of compactness in that embedding uh, because there's a, an infinite dimensional group of transformations that leaves the quantities invariant. And this is a way to understand uh, how this compactness fails exactly. What's the defect of compactness? So here we have the profile decomposition. We have a bounded sequence in H1 cross L2. And for each J, we have a linear solution. And then we have parameters. Lambda Jn is a scaling parameter. Xjn is a space translation. Tjn is a time translation. So these are sequences of parameters. And we call such a sequence orthogonal if somehow the parameters don't see each other as expressed by these conditions. Yeah, I, I, I have to stress that all of this is in the notes that are online. So uh, you don't really have to take notes unless it helps you learn the stuff. Okay? But all of this is part of the stuff that's online. So we call this a profile decomposition by of this sequence if the parameters are orthogonal, which means what we just saw. And when we look at the linear solution with data, the original sequence, minus the sum of the modulated linear solutions. By modulated, we, we mean here that they are translated in space and time and rescaled. In, and the, the rescaling is the one that we saw uh, leaves the scale invariant. Okay? And now, okay, something good has to be happening here. Otherwise, this is meaningless. What, what the thing that is good is that when you take the difference between your linear solution and this particular linear solutions modulated, then the error is a, will be uniformly bounded, but in the dispersive norm, it will go to zero. Okay? So the error is small, not in the H1 cross L2 no norm, that can't be done, but in the dispersive norm, the L5, L10 norm. Okay? And uh, Bahuri and Girard proved that for any bounded sequence, some subsequence verifies a profile decomposition, and the error verifies this uh, smallness in the dispersive norm. And you can get some other norms that uh, also go to zero. For example, something that's not the energy norm, but is 
the L6 norm, and we know that L6 is controlled by the gradient being in L2 in 3D by the ordinary Sobolev inequality. Okay? So this is something, again, slightly weaker than the energy norm. But it's strictly weaker. Okay? Now, uh, how do we construct this, these profiles? You construct them as the thing that is over there. Is there a fly? Yes, no. There is a fly, there is a fly. okay. <laughs> I'm not having visions, all right. <laughs> so, so how do you construct these profiles? <laughs> what you do is you take a, an orthogonal sequence of parameters, and then you, res you modulate your sequence of solutions. You take the appropriately uh, time-translated uh, linear solution, and that converges weakly to H1 cross L in H1 cross L2 to each profile. And th the fact that, uh, that uh, this holds can be seen to be equivalent to the fact that this sequence, which went to zero in the dispersive norm, also goes to zero weakly in H1 cross L2. And now a very important feature of these uh, profile decompositions are these Pythagorean expansions of the energy. This gives us uh, the linear energy can be expressed as a sum of the linear energies of the profiles plus the error. And the same can be said about the L6 norm. And therefore, also for the nonlinear energy, you have a Pythagorean expansion. Okay? Okay, I'm going to skip this. And now, all of this is about linear equations, but we're dealing with nonlinear equations, so we need to introduce the notion of nonlinear profile. So, what is a nonlinear profile? associated to the linear profile UJL and sequence of parameters lambda j, t, j is a solution of the uh, nonlinear wave equation such that minus t, j, n, lambda g, j, n belongs to the maximal interval of existence of UJ and the difference between the linear and the nonlinear profile as the parameter goes to n goes to infinity tends to zero. So that's what we call the nonlinear profile. Okay. And now it's easy to see that there's always a nonlinear profile after extraction in N. And uh, we can always, okay, so we're in a setting in which all limits exist, all real limits exist because they could be plus infinity or minus infinity, and by existence of the limit we mean up to subsequence. So if I have a sequence of real numbers, up to subsequence, it will either go to plus infinity, to minus infinity, or to some finite limit. So that's why all sequences of numbers converge. Don't tell that to your calculus students, please. <laughs> okay. So we can uh, find uh, nonlinear profiles, and in the case when the time of existence is uh, minus infinity or plus infinity, you can see from the construction of the linear profile that the nonlinear of the nonlinear profile that it must scatter forward in time. And now we will also consider modulated nonlinear profiles. And these nonlinear profiles, what are we going to use this for? They turn out to be building blocks for solutions of the nonlinear problem now. And uh, there is a technical statement that I will flash once, and I will then refer to as the approximation theorem. Okay? And this will be, and uh, from now on, I will be speaking about blocks. And when I say block, I mean a non-zero, non-linear profile. Okay? 
And if you really want to know what I will be meaning, you go to the notes. Okay? So, this is the approximation theorem. I have a sequence. I've taken a subsequence so that it already admits a profile decomposition. Now I look at the nonlinear solution. And now consider first the easy case. All the nonlinear profiles scatter forward. Okay? Then I, I call R remainder to be this difference the nonlinear solution minus the sum of the blocks, the modulated blocks, minus the linear solution with data W, N. Then this remainder goes to zero, not only in the dispersive norm, but in the uh, energy norm. Okay? So for all intents and purposes, I can think of this solution as being made out of this sum. So it breaks up my solution into blocks. Okay? And this holds, in this case, for all time. In particular, all these solutions exist for all times. Okay? And the, the second part of the theorem I is the one that you more often have to use, unfortunately, which is uh, maybe not all of these guys scatter forward. Maybe some of them scatter and some of them don't. And so as soon as we pick a time such that the modulated solution, the modulated nonlinear profile stays away from its final time, and all the uh, space-time norms remain uniformly bounded, then the same thing is valid. So the conclusion of the, approximating, of the approximation theorem is that you can go up to times that give you uniform boundedness of all the uh, space-time norms of the modulated profiles. Okay? And this is how we will uh, use this uh, thing. And now let's uh, make it go away. <laughs> And let me now claim that I've taught you about the approximation theorem and the nonlinear profiles. So this will be the last audiovisual presentation. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's bring back my chicken scratches here. Okay. Is it okay? No. Now we turn to to a two important concepts here. concept of focusing and defocusing. Now the, this nonlinear wave equation has an energy which is constant, is a constant of the motion. Now I'll write down what the energy is. So this is the energy, the nonlinear energy, which is an invariant of the motion. That means that for each t in the maximal interval of existence, this energy is constant. Okay? So what's the matter with this energy? There's a, mi a minus sign, right? We could have negative energy here. Okay? So why is that? That's because the Laplacian, which gives rise to the kinetic energy and the nonlinearity, have opposing signs. The Laplacian is a negative operator, and in front of the u to the 5, I have the plus sign. So the two things compete with each other. 
from the scaling point of view, the, the Laplacian and the u to the 5 have the same strength. And that's reflected in that scaling. And so there's a competition between the two in the case when there's a negative sign. And uh, this is the focusing effect. <coughs> now, we could also have defocusing, the defocusing sign, right? So what does that mean? I, instead of having u to the 5, I put minus u to the 5 in the equation, right? Everything that I've said so far works the same way for that. And for the, so this is the focusing, and for the defocusing, you get a plus. That means that there's no competition between the two. They just help each other. So this equation, the defocusing equation, was studied extensively uh, in the 80s, 90s, and beginning of the 2000s. So there were a huge number of works in this, very important works. Uh, I'll mention some names, starting uh, with Jurgens, then uh, uh, Struve, then uh, Grilakis, then Chatin and Struve, then uh, Bahuri and Girard, and Bahuri and Chatin. And the offshoot of all of these works, Kapitansky also had an important work here. The offshoot of this huge collection of works is the following statement. For the defocusing equation, if I take any data in H1 cross L2, small or large, the solution exists for all times and scatters. So the behavior is linear at infinity. So that's the statement of soliton resolution in this case. There are no solitons. You just have the linear term, the radiation, and that's the end of the story. There's no nonlinear dynamics. It's just the linear dynamics. There's no blow up in finite time. But of course, it took a very, very long time to prove this, and a lot of works. But those guys did it, so fine, we have to move on, right? That's, that's what we do. So now let's start the. F so now I'm going to n never again mention the defocusing equation. Let's start with the focusing equation, and, and let's see what happens here. Because as I said, everything up to now works the same for both cases, focusing and defocusing. So the first thing I'm going to show you is that for the focusing equation, there's finite time blow up. Oh, before I say this, I want to say something about the finite speed of propagation for the nonlinear wave equation. If you remember, I said that you construct the solution of the nonlinear wave equation by a fixed point argument. Therefore, it can be solved by Picard iteration. And if you think about what that means, you can inductively prove that the nonlinear wave equation has finite speed of propagation. Okay, because in the wave equation there's something with the right hand side also. And we inductively prove that it's zero in there. So that finite speed of propagation still is true for the nonlinear wave equation in the interval in which it exists. Of course, if it doesn't exist, you can't have finite speed. So we, we leave that. Uh, however, what's n definitely not true is the strong Huygens principle for the nonlinear wave equation, because that gets destroyed by the inhomogeneous term. Okay. So now I'm going to uh, talk about finite time blow up. The first thing that you do to, to understand time, finite time blow up is I'm going to forget about the Laplacian. <coughs> I'm just going to consider functions of t. Okay, so then I have the ODE, and I can write u of x t to be um, 
there's a, a number here that you have to write. Okay, so that's that function solves the nonlinear wave equation. Why? Because it solves the the ODE dt squared and u equals u to the fifth. What happens to this guy at t equal to one? It goes boom, right? It explodes. Now you could complain, rightfully, that this doesn't have finite energy, so maybe that's the, the problem. But no, because there's finite speed of propagation. I can chop it off at time zero. I can chop it off here. And then up to time one, in a very long bit, I will be equal to that by finite speed. And therefore, uh, by chopping it off, I can make it to be in the energy space, but I can't fix the blow up by finite speed of propagation. And so there are solutions that have the property that the limit as t tends to t star of h1 cross L2 is infinity. Okay? And this we call the ODE blow up or the type or type 1 blow up. Oh, before I forget, I'm sorry. You may wonder why I put this perturbation theorem. Let's backtrack a little bit. Why did I put this perturbation theorem here? Because this approximation theorem that I flashed is proven using this perturbation theorem. Okay, this is what you, you really need to. So, okay, let me erase that. So what is very interesting in the energy critical case is that there's also something called type 2 blow up. So what is a type 2 blow up? These are solutions which up to their finite final time remain bounded in H1 cross L2. But still T plus is finite. That means that the solution cannot be continued beyond T plus. Okay, so how, how is this possible? What is it that's happening? So what's happening is that the gradient of the solution squared is concentrating like a delta mass. Okay, so that's what the meaning of this type 2 blow up. And so therefore the solution cannot be continued continuously across that blow up time. <coughs> okay, now I write the definition, but I don't say, uh, you can say to me, why do you do that? I mean, do you know that this happens? And yes, I know that it happens. So examples of this type were proven first by uh, Krieger, Schlag, and Tataru. in the four-dimensional case by Hilaire and Raphael. I, I, let me not put dates. In the fifth-dimensional case 
by Jacek Dendridge, who just defended his thesis last week. So this is a uh, okay. So that's so there are already striking differences between the focusing and defocusing case. Right? There's finite time blow up, and it can be of two different varieties. So what ha happens at time plus infinity? There are solutions which exist for all positive time, let's say, but do not scatter to a linear solution. So the first examples are solutions to the nonlinear elliptic equation. So now instead of forgetting about d dt squared, instead of forgetting about the Laplacian, I forget about d dt squared. Now since I have a solution to the elliptic equation, and I regard it as a function independent of t, I get a solution of the nonlinear wave equation, just automatically. <coughs> now, who are these solutions? So, and let's consider non-zero solutions, otherwise we're, it's not an interesting class, and we will call that q belongings to, belongs to sigma. The first example is this guy. So they do exist. Okay, this is a, a well known solution to the nonlinear elliptic equation. <laughs> now, this nonlinear elliptic equation was very well studied in the late 80s beginning of the 90s, maybe even early 80s, even 60s, anyway, in connection with the Yamabe problem in differential geometry. So the Yamabe problem is the problem of whether you're given a compact manifold in uh, dimension 3 and higher, whether by the conformally deforming the metric you can find one of constant scalar curvature. So th this problem was solved by, uh, by Oban in high dimensions and then in the lower dimensions by Rick Shen. And in order to solve these problems, this elliptic equation was crucial and in particular this solution was crucial. Okay? Yeah, I think is the, uh, the set of non-zero oh. solutions, okay? And I made a mistake, it was three, not six there. Okay, okay so uh, there are a few things I want to say uh, about W before we go on, okay? First of all, of course uh, there's also translates and scaling of W. Well, let me scale. That also solves the same equation. Right, this is the, the scaling here. Um, the first property that I want to mention about W is that <coughs> plus and minus W lambda are the only radial solutions. These are the only radial non-zero solutions. And this is a combination of, of work of Pohojaev and Gidas Nierenberg. 
Okay, you get that. The second thing I want to say is the translates and scalings of W are the only non-negative solutions. These are the only non-negative solutions. And this is a result of Gita's knee and Nuremberg. Okay? Okay, you can tell me, well, maybe there's no others. There's no other solutions. Why are you bothering with the notation sigma? No, <laughs> that's not the case. There's infinitely many, there's a whole continuum of variable sign solutions to this equation. They are not classified. Nobody can write them all down. But we know that the, the possible energies are a continuum. Okay? And this was proved first by Ding in the 80s. And uh, more recently, there are more explicit constructions due to uh, Del Pino, uh, Musso, Pacar, and Wei. Okay. So there's a whole zoo zoology of solutions here. And we don't know them all, and uh, we don't know what they look like. We do know some uniform decay bounds. For instance, the f this one is the one that decays the slowest. Okay. So the others, they decay also polynomially, or? Yes. Yes, they always have polynomial decay. There's a conformal, uh, there's a, not, there is a conformal transfer, I don't want to talk about that, but there's a, a, an inversion, like a Kelvin transform, and that shows that the, the, they're all polynomial. Okay, and there's unique continuation for them, so they can't vanish in an open set. Okay. Uh, okay, so this solution is called the ground state. Why do we call it the ground state? And there are two reasons. And I don't know, I'm going to use this. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, but it's, it's rough. It makes a weird sound. So I'm not sure, Frank. The only problem is I lost the other one. So I, <laughs> I have no choice. <laughs> OK? Yes. OK, ground state. The two reasons that I'm going to give are connected. If Q belonging belongs to sigma, then the energy of Q is bigger than or equal to energy of W, which is a positive number. So W has the smallest energy among all possible non-zero solutions. And the energy of W can be computed. It's a number you can express in terms of pi and gamma functions. Okay? I, I, I don't want to write it down. I, I don't remember it. Then there's another uh, I mentioned before the Sobolev embedding in three dimensions. Else, uh, uh, if you have a gradient in L2, you're in L6. And that embedding has a best constant that we call C3. And W and it's this family plus or minus gives you the extremals, the unique extremals for that inequality. And that's due to Oban and Talenti. Okay? Very good.
So let me now state in which way this ground state plays a role in determining the scattering behavior. Okay? And this is what we call the ground state uh, conjecture or the ground state theorem or So this is the theorem that Merle and I proved right now a long time ago. The, the paper appeared in 08. Suppose that I look at data u0, u1, whose energy is strictly smaller than the energy of w. Of course, w is constant in time, so the ddt of w is 0. So that's how I, why I write w, comma 0. Then three things can happen. First one. is that the L2 norm of the gradient of U0 is smaller than the L2 norm of the gradient of W. Then, <laughs> the, T's are, the, the solution exists forever and U scatters. The second, thing that can happen is that the gradient is bigger than the gradient of W. Then The solution blows up on both sides. And the third thing that can happen does not happen. Uh, no u0, u1 such that uh, you have equal. So the third possibility is, is not a possibility. Okay, that is ruled out by this uh, assumption. Okay, so in the energy space, if you are below the energy of W, and that is a fixed number that we can write down. It's not some epsilon. Okay, it's a number. Then you can decide whether you live forever and scatter in both times directions or you blow up in both times directions. And this is the, the result. So that's wh why uh, this we call the ground state conjecture because it tells you what happens at the level of energy below the ground state. Okay? Yes? The norms here are L2 norms? Yes. Yes, if I don't write, I'm in L2. But don't think that I'm consistent, okay? <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, we have a few more minutes. And uh, the first thing I want to say is how do we know that this W does not scatter? Okay, you could have asked me that. You should have asked me that. Why doesn't W scatter? Because if you have a scattering solution, and I integrate it over x is less than 1, I, I fix a box, this tends to 0 as t tends to infinity if u scatters. Because for linear solutions, when you confine the energy in space, the result goes to 0 in time. Okay? And clearly w doesn't have this property because it's constant in t. It doesn't go anywhere. And w is non-zero, right? I mean, it's a positive option. And the same is true for any elliptic solution. No elliptic solution can scatter. 
Okay? No function constant in time can scatter. So I want to say a few more things. So I've lost all of my erases now. Okay. So there's other objects. So let's go back to T plus is infinity. <coughs> there are other solutions which stay bounded. in H1 cross L2 as T goes to infinity. And uh, here let me mention some constructions of such things. There, there's a, a examples due to uh, Krieger and Schlag. Where you have solutions that instead of scattering to a linear solution, they scatter to W. Okay? You start out very near W and your radial, and you do it in the right side of a certain hypersurface in function space, then this happens. You're late, Thomas. <laughs> okay. So that's one example. There are other examples which uh, we no don't know where they're going or at what speed. And these are constructions of Doniger and Krieger. Then there's constructions of Martel and Merle. In 5D, where you go to uh, multiple bubbles. Instead of going to one bubble, you go to multiple bubbles. And uh, then there's other constructions due to Gendrange in similar directions. I don't know if Jessica is here or not. You're here. Okay. You can ask him. Okay. <coughs> Finally, I've got five minutes and I will. Yes. And for the sake of the situation, your main theorem, you have tied to two Galois necessarily? No, we don't know. We ex we, we su but uh, we suspect it's type 1, but, uh, yeah. but it hasn't been proved. Okay? This is a very good problem. But it would be no Galois state, it's unknown. Yeah. Uh, there's an antecedent of this result, for example that uh, uh, is due to Levine, that if the energy is negative, then there's finite time blow up. And it's not known if it's type 2 or type 1. OK? So even going OK. Other, <coughs> other questions? Please don't hesitate, OK? But of course, if you overdo it, I'll stop you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next thing I want to discuss are the traveling wave solutions. After all, if we want to prove solid and resolution, we have to identify who the traveling waves are. Okay? So let's take a solution to the elliptic equation. And let's take a direction, L, which is less than 1. Now we will use another invariance of the equation, which is the uh, invariance under Lorentz transformations. Th this is a well-known fact that the nonlinear <laughs> wave equation is invariant under Lorentz transformations. So let me write that down. So I'll, I'll write Q sub L of x t, and I will write it in this peculiar way. Uh, 
So this notation shows explicitly that these objects are traveling waves. Right? They're just traveling in one direction, the direction given by L. Okay? But what does Q sub L of x0 mean? And this is a, a, a horrible mess. This is Q, uh, yeah, I, I'm missing a little bit. Okay, maybe apparently this extra bridges cannot connect. Okay. Everything is multiplied by L. It's a scalar, so multiplied by L. is a vector, X is a vector, this is a number, so this gives me a vector. Yes, the, the, the whole thing multiplies L. You want to put another, I can put another. <laughs> if that makes Frank happy, that's okay. Okay, so this formula is a horrible mess. The, what you should do is uh, choose L to be in the direction of x1, let's say, and make it a scalar L, little l, times e1, and write down this definition, and you will see what this is. Yes, is there more? Q on right is not Q. Oh, I am sorry. I had it right the first time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now this is a solution of NLW. Because this Lorentz transformation maps solutions of NLW into solutions of NLW. And this is explicitly a traveling wave solution. Okay? And then I have a theorem here, which is what I will conclude with. These are all the traveling waves. So if you have a traveling wave in a direction L, necessarily L has to have length less than 1. And the traveling wave then is the Lorentz transformation of a solution to the elliptic equation. Okay? So that's, that's what I mean by this theorem. So at least now we know how to formulate the soliton resolution conjecture because we know what the traveling waves are. Okay, and, and this is where we stop. Thank you. I have a comment. Uh, yes, yes. For the solitary resolution conjecture for the cubic NLS yes. uh, focusing, I think it's not uh, even that case, no, in general. No, no, no. In the 1D case, it is. Uh, it could have, uh, in, for example, infinitely many solitons. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. So you don't know? No, you know it generically. You know it for, for generic data. I can give you the reference. Okay, I, I don't know. It, it I, I think it's not 100.
uh, well, maybe it is not a hundred percent <laughs> proof, but it is a certainly <laughs> suggested. <laughs> what? Some uh, Soviet author. Ah, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But for KDV, it's heavy too. For KDV, it's, it's proved. Uh, now, for NLS, I don't know. It depends on uh, the level of uh, precision that you want uh, in the proofs. <laughs> Yeah, and of course, you know, for modified KDV, you have to include breathers. I mean, there's <laughs> all sorts of things that you have to do. But I, w I didn't want to get into that at that time. Yeah. Well, if not, let's think, uh, thanks the speaker, and uh, let's have a coffee break.